Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. So glad to have you with us on this noon uh, today. And before we get into our discussion with our roundtable and also celebrate our fifth anniversary on the air, want to invite you to two events next week that are happening that I think you'll be interested in. Uh, Congressman Scott Ridgell is holding his second annual Women's Symposium. It is on Tuesday, September the 15th from 8 until 1. And I hope you come because I'd love to see you. I have the honor of serving as the keynote speaker that morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. I know it's early. But we're going to have a good time. So come on out. It is free and open to the public. And if you'd like more information, you can go to uh, or you can call 687-8290, 687-8290 and find out more information. So that is free and open to the public. And that same evening, come on out to Town Point Club. There will be a discussion of the future of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. It's being moderated by Dr. Alvin Sheck Snyder. You know, he is a former president of uh, Thomas Nelson Community College, an author um, and uh, is very involved in uh, the future of uh, HBCUs, and he has put together a panel, uh, Mr. Gil Bland, Mr. Jackie Zell, Mr. Charlie Hill, and Ms. Barbara Ham Lee. So come on out. It is free, also open to the public. We're going to be talking about the future of HBCUs from um, very different perspectives. So we're going to talk about governance. We're going to talk about alumni. We're going to talk about uh, uh, academics. Um, So it should be a great discussion. That also is free and open to the public 6 p.m. on Tuesday, September the 15th. If you want to know more information, call 547-4596-547-4596. So can you believe it? Another View is five years old. Now, I remember the first Friday we went on the radio. It was with the Another View Roundtable purposely because the Roundtable was such a hit when we were on TV. So, of course, they are here to celebrate with us today. Now, normally I'd introduce first Roger Chesley, who's a columnist with the Virginian Pilot, but he's out sick. So, Roger, we know you're listening and we hope that you feel better. And But so graciously filling in for him is Eric Clavel. He is the assistant professor and director of the Hampton University Pre-Law Institute. Hi, Eric. You're always there when we need you. We appreciate you. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Uh, Carol Pretlow is a political science professor at Norfolk State University. Hey, Carol. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Thank you so much. The hardest working man I know, <laughs> Mr. Will Levis, is a journalist, <laughs> author, talk show host, professor. You want to add anything else? <laughs> Lord, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> Got to keep, gotta do something to keep the lights on. Always a pleasure. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and our favorite community yeah. activist, Mr. Bill Thomas, is here. He's uh, just had to run into, um, um, he's coming in from out of town. So he will be here. Oh, actually, he had to take a call, very important call. So he will be with us on the radio in just a moment. But he is here with us. So before we get started, we do want to acknowledge that this is the 14th anniversary of 9-11. Will, you wanted to say a few words? Yeah, I remember at the time I was living in Chicago working at the Tribune and um, was actually on the train coming in, the commuter train coming in from the south suburbs where I live and got off downtown and it looked like a ghost town. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is going on? Yeah, because I happened to be going in a little late. And it's when I got to the office is when we saw mm-hmm. the second plane come through it because the first had already hit so it was really um you know it's unforgettable and it's amazing that it's it's seems like it's been it's been so long i mean 14 years but it seems like it was just yesterday it really does i remember i was uh the um working in the newsroom at wtkr um here in town and um was getting ready to go to work when the first plane hit and just knowing that first thing i had to do was get to work because you knew it was going to be a huge uh, Newsday. Um, Eric, what were your, your memories? Well, I remember driving into work on the interstate listening to NPR like I, uh, like, like I usually would do. And I hear, <clears throat> I believe it was Tom broke off, broke in and said, we believe a plane has hit the one of the mm-hmm. Twin Towers in, uh, in New York. And I was just in New York a year prior to that at the United Nations as part of the Model United Nations. I was there 
as part of a delegation and uh, gave a speech in a great hall. I just had a great time in that particular area. So it was really fresh in my mind. Uh, but I, I, I think that the this being the second terrorist attack uh, on America, the first, of course, being Timothy, Timothy McVeigh uh, bombing the federal building uh, in the, what we call the Midwest. But seeing it hit New York and seeing it hit the Twin Towers, I think that really brought it home for everyone uh, to see that, you know, anyone is vulnerable mm-hmm. and uh you know, tragedy can hit anywhere. So, again, our hearts and prayers go out to all those families and also the first responders and everyone still dealing with that. So, as America, we will rise again. Absolutely. Carol? Wow. At the time, I was involved with some security analysis for the defense industry and for the defense department, and we had been involved with it for about two months. We at Norfolk State and the Office of Sponsored Programs, and the call came to me from Paula Shaw, who was the director of research, and I was astounded, but I didn't believe it. And I said, oh, Paula, every event is not a terrorist attack. This is just some people who acted criminally, and let's not get upset about it. But by the time I got to the TV and saw it, and then I got to Norfolk State, and the light, the the buses were off the street, and I was like, oh, my God. And then my first thought was, okay, the largest military installation in the world. I'm going to Smithfield, my hometown. And then I remembered Surrey Nuclear Power Station. I said, oh, guess not. That's 11 miles away. Then I said, oh, Elizabeth City. And I was like, oh, Navy. I said, okay, I'll hunker down. So I was astounded. Um, I couldn't believe it. And it had an impact on the research that we were doing at Norfolk State because we got called immediately, come on, up your game here, let's get this done. So. Well, it certainly had an impact on everyone, um, and, and it will continue to have an impact um, for, for years and years to come. Uh, let me change topics. The um, Republican presidential race. <laughs> the greatest show on earth. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest show on earth. Is that how you just? Okay, so I, I got online this morning. Now, according to the Huffington Post pollster, which tracks, uh, which is tracking 155 polls from 29 pollsters in the Republican race for president this morning. This is as of this morning. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is currently in the lead with 33 percent, followed by Ben Carson with 17.9 percent. Then Jeb Bush with 9%, Ted Cruz 6.1%, and rounding out the top five is Marco Rubio with 4.8%. Now, um, the whole idea of Donald Trump and Ben Carson, neither of these gentlemen have been in politics before. Your thoughts, Will? I think that a lot of it is is very early, and but also people are very frustrated with what is going on in Congress and the inability of uh, politicians to get things moving and all of the bickering that go, that goes on. And so they're actually thinking that maybe someone who's accomplished in another arena would be a fresher approach to any of this. But at the end of the day, um, Trump, in the way our system works, <laughs> it's it's – for example, you hear Trump saying, I'm going to build a, a wall in the south border. I mean, he can't uh, commission a wall to be built by himself with a, his own order, and that's it. And Canada, don't forget. Yeah, and, I mean, he's, he's, that, that's not how our system works. So unless you have an understanding, an intricate understanding of how politics works and how to get things done, like, for example, a Lyndon B. Johnson, who can sit down with people and get things done, nothing's going to happen. So I, I think that it's just very early, and we still just we just need to wait and see what's going to happen. Eric? Yeah, so, well, as I mentioned before, this is the greatest show on earth. I mean, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Um, you know, seeing the career politicians, I mean, really not knowing what to do. But um, I, I hear what Will said, that this is, is early in, on in the race. And that's what the establishment keep, kept saying. But they know that they're in trouble. And really what I believe the Republican Party, the constituents of the Republican Party, have figured out is that the Republican Party was really a party for the people, the working man, and so forth. However, it's really a business party. 
It's really about big business. If you look at all most of the legislation passed that pro- that profits large business, large corporations, for-profit universities, those are uh, authored and pushed through by Republicans because it's big business. But they need the vote of the common person, the Midwest and so forth, which is why you get these different messages. But I, I believe what happened uh, on Wall Street where – uh, individuals, white individuals that suffered major financial loss and had no recourse and said to themselves, wait a minute, I'm poor. Wait a minute. This is not supposed to happen to me. And they look at their politicians and over and over again, what happened to Eric Cantor in northern in the Richmond area and so forth. These are all indications that the people are sick and tired of big business profiting and the little man not profiting. So now you see Donald Trump, who's a salesman, uh, you see Ben Carson, who's you know very accomplished. They're coming out speaking the truth, you know, not worried about um, uh, what their uh, uh, investors or, or backers are saying and so forth. Because for the most part, Trump is running his own campaign. And, and look, Trump's having the time of his life. I mean, this is his, this is his last hoorah, Mr. Big Business. This is it. This is exactly, exactly. So again, again, I. I, I I saw my former governor, uh, Governor Bobby Jindal, uh, talk about, you know, Trump will ruin a, con- uh, a, a state. I'm like, listen, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> you know, what you did to Louisiana and still do it. <laughs> but, but, but for the most part, people are sick and tired of it. And, and Trump is, has a great show going on. And let me tell you, he's going to get the nomination. He's going to get it. Oh, you, you heard, heard it here first. So. You heard it here first. Bill. <laughs> I just heard the the, uh, the part about the Republican Party. Actually, the part, Republican Party is repu- it's a party of freedom. They were the party that freed African Americans from the, the throes of slavery. And also, in the late 70s, during Nixon, was the party that freed up African American business mm-hmm. by creating a lot of business and sending for minorities to get into business with set-asides and 8As. And if you remember correctly, through the 70s through the 90s with Herman Valentine, a lot of entrepreneurs mm-hmm. that did a lot of businesses and a lot of things were growing and growing, especially in Northern Virginia. There was a Fortune magazine article that said that if you want to be rich and you're black, you need to move to Virginia because they had set up the infrastructure for minorities to get into all of these government contracts. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's wrong with the Republican Party now and Eric Cantor, who I actively, actively take, took time to get him out of there, he actually voted against the HBCU bill that would have given us $2 billion to build up our technology infrastructure, a, a program that Senator Allen had put together. And Cantor, as the leader of the Republican Party in the House, personally sit there and blocked the bill. Hmm. And so I said the first time that he gets in trouble and anybody can come close to, to beating him to beat him. Now, the problem, and I'm more conservative and more Republican the reason I'm for Trump, because I'm against everybody else, because that regime has not produced anything for the, to the common folks and for the middle income people, both black and white. Mm-hmm. In addition to that, they lied about it. And so I don't want any of them elected, Bush or any of them. It could be anybody. Mm-hmm. But then that's why Trump is getting through this. Now, uh, secondarily, I was questioned on that, and there's been several legitimate polls that have come out to say it, Trump has 25% of the black vote, legitimate polls. I mean, people that have been doing this for years. And the first time in my history of politics, I have had black people come to me and saying they like what this guy is saying because we are left out. The middle class hasn't had a raise in 10 years. There's no opportunity. It's going to all the systems and all the people that Trump is fighting against. And that's why I'm for him, because I'm not supporting any of those other guys, maybe, maybe the doctor and maybe some other people and the, and the young lady, oh. Carla, who's, who's running, but not those other ones. They have not delivered anything for not only the black community, but for America. Oh, I must be losing my mind. I'm <laughs> agreeing with you. Um, when I looked at the debate, and again, I, I'm sorry, I looked at Trump as a showman. I looked at him being able to appeal to the masses because, unfortunately, the masses don't care about the strategies for getting bills through Congress and the political lineup. So he was speaking language that they could understand. But then Ben Carson got up there, and for me, I'm not a Republican, but I could be. Um, I saw a man who was calm, poised, articulate, knew the issues, and he was almost the counter-opposite 
of of the other candidates there, particularly Trump. And I said, now, if I were a Republican and were making this choice, I would go Ben Carson. No, he that might not be right in tune with all of the issues and in all of the perspectives that I have, but here is a man who is so intelligent, so articulate, and who shows evidence of thinking through issues rather than just going to a gut ex- response. Okay. Okay. okay, go ahead, Will, and then I want to bring up a, a, one other point. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that I think John Kasich of Ohio mm-hmm. is someone that people will begin to look at as the debates move forward and you get a little bit past the show, and you have to start really having substantive proposals and programs. Again, the the governor of Ohio who, again, understands politics, understands business. As you move further along, I think it's going to start to come down to that, especially when you have one-to-one, one-on-one debates. The sideshow and all of that is... is, Mm -hmm. It's going to be less of an ability to be able to get just get that past. Okay, so I read some numbers about the Republican presidential race, but let's take a look at the Democratic presidential race at this point. Um, again, Huffington Post pollster tracking 130 polls from 22 pollsters. Hillary Clinton in the lead with 44.9%, followed by Bernie Sanders with 24.6%. Then Joe Biden with 19.1%, and he's not even a declared candidate. Jim Webb with 1.3%, Martin O'Malley with 1.2%, and Lincoln Chaffee with 05 I didn't even know who that was, so I missed him. He when used to be he governor, did, senator of Vermont or something. Okay, because I, I missed him when he even declared. So, But my point being... For if you are a Democrat <laughs> at this point, uh, Eric, what are what are you saying or what are you thinking in terms of what your choices might be? Sure. Well, this is I believe that this election cycle is the last election cycle for the establishment of, in both parties. Uh, I believe that America has, as as Bill stated, you know they've looked at uh, these individuals and said you have not delivered upon any of your rhetoric, and that's all it's been. The poor is getting poor. The middle class is shrinking, and the rich is just getting richer. Now, we are a capitalist country, but one thing about capitalism is that you, the, the market should balance itself out with various forces, but there is a lot of legislation pushed by special interests that makes it unfair and not a fair uh, level playing field for the, for the small business person. Uh, as it relates to the Democratic Party, I believe that right now a lot of people are kind of holding their nose with the Clintons. And and I think they're kind of holding their nose with with the Clintons, and they're pulling for straws, and that's why they're asking for Joe Biden to come in. But but I do believe once President Obama leaves office, he's going to become the new face of the of the of Democratic Party as it relates to grassroots, and the fundraising part is going to be a battle between the Clintons and the Obamas, and you're going to see a new rise of new Democrats and a new rise of new Republicans coming up in 2020. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Bill? I agree. I agree. One hundred percent agree. I I think that this has been coming on for some while now, and you can look at either the Republicans or whatever, and and sometimes I'm with them and sometimes I'm not. I'm not with them. They're not doing anything for me. You find out that all of these local delegates and and senators and congressmen go to Richmond or go to Washington poor, and now they're rich. They're multimillionaires, and all of them. And here we are sacrificing, doing all of these kinds of things. They don't accept anything that they legislate. They don't accept uh, Obamacare. They have their own. See, they don't accept anything. It's all up to us. And, and right now, the Af- especially in the African-American community, uh, and, and we got to look at our black elected officials. They're not delivering. And uh, they go to Richmond every year. They have no agenda. They have no economic agenda. They have no educational agenda. They have no criminal justice agenda. They sit up here and say, let's let all the immigrants that are illegal be free. How about all the people that were thrown in jail for smoking a marijuana or something stupid with the police? Free them first. People are tired. And it's to me, on the one side, I'm saying I don't want to hear anything Hillary Clinton has to say. It was Clinton, her husband, who put a lot of these laws in enforcement in terms of the, the criminal justice system. And they don't want to take accountability for it. But at the end of the day, you look at your community. Are you better off or worse off than you were with either Republicans, with Bush, who was absolutely mindless with those wars, and that's why I voted for Obama, said no more wars, 
or if you look at Clinton or if you look at any of these people, they're not delivering for the people. So if you had to to pick two candidates today, oh, Lord. For, <laughs> oh, Lord, don't ask I'm curious as to what you all think. If there was an election today, then who would be the candidates? Well, any thoughts? If you, I don't know. I haven't looked that closely, okay. like at the Republican field, mm-hmm. all the Democratic field. I mean, but a candidate that I would be looking at is someone along the lines who is looking to do all right. What is going on with the country in terms of its infrastructure What that has like a clear vision of where do we want to take America from a practical standpoint and how are we going to make this place better as opposed to someone who does not come off as who, – who is coming off as inauthentic or just this is another notch in my <laughs> career right, yeah. that I want to add on to what I've done. Absolutely. That's okay. what I would be looking for. Okay. Anybody else? Well, if, if, if I could, I, I believe Clinton is going to get the nomination on the Democratic side. I've said it in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. I also believe that they're going to look at the Castro brothers out of, out of San Antonio, more specifically the one who's serving in Congress at the House of Representatives to be a vice presidential run in order to shore up the Hispanic vote. Um, on the Republican side, to tell you the truth, I have no, absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea. I mean, that thing is so much up for grabs. I'm, I'm really just enjoying the show. This is great. Well, I join you. I'm just okay. enjoying the show. I do think Hillary's going to get it. Um, I'm not a big Hillary supporter. I agree with some of the things that she has initiated, the whole idea of education, particularly um, the two-year education cycle on the college level, and I can see where we need to improve our educational position. I think the thing that concerns me is this whole wiretap um, scenario. Um, the emails. The emails. The emails. The emails. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> emails. emails. I, I'm concerned because now I don't have information about it, but from the very beginning, to me, honesty is the best policy. Absolutely. Just come out and say, I'm sorry, I, I made a up. mistake, this is what it is. And I think the American public, will, we don't know the intricacies of this should go here and that should go there. Just stand up and take responsibility. And okay. I think she will get the women's vote. Oh, yeah. okay. wow. All right, look, then we're going to move on to another topic. Last thing. Look, Eric. quick five seconds. The Look, never count the Clintons out. They've weathered more scandals no. than than the law That's allows, right. okay? <laughs> they will get it. And also, the reason why uh, Hillary will get it is because Joe Biden, honestly, he's going through an emotional time right now. If, okay. if the Clintons uh-huh. don't get straight with President Obama, she has no chance. She has no chance. And I think President Obama is one of the shrewdest politicians <laughs> ever, was underestimated that ever walked on the face of this earth, right inside with, with President Clinton. And if they don't get a straight with him, she has no chance. It'll be Kasich and Carlson or somebody with some sense uh, that can make some things go. But uh, Clinton, she can't. I mean, it's, it's just she was for the war. And, <laughs> and then you talk about the last comment I have is about immigration and how can you uh, deport 11 million supposedly illegal immigrants. Well, they, they deported 25 million Africans from Africa 300 years ago. <laughs> And I mean, so that, anything no. is possible. So <laughs> my point is, and it's the racial context, America can do whatever it wants to do if it's in their interest. And so people are tired of all this stuff. They want to know what's going to do and help their families and their children. Okay. And if you're just joining us, we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of Another View with our Another View roundtable. Eric Clavel with the with Hampton University, filling in for Roger Chesley. Carol Pretlow with NSU, community activist Bill Thomas, and journalist, author, and talk show host Will LaViste. Uh, Baltimore City settled with the Gray family this week for $6.4 million in the death of Freddie Gray. Enough money? Bill? Uh, uh, Norfolk Police, I'm out here breaking in somebody's car. <laughs> Come and get me right now. <laughs> just kill me clean. <laughs> What's this Six and a half million dollars, and he doesn't even have an education. I, I'm not trying to be belittling this stuff, but I at least have some potential I- income power to go forward. So I'm at least worth 15. So <laughs> just come on and get me. I'm going, I'll be turning to Hampton and Newport News later on this evening, and I'll leave my location. And I have a will there, too. Just let me sign my will before y'all leave. 
and I'll forgive you for the murder. I'll forgive you. All right, now be serious. Come on. No, actually, you know I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking I this know, is I another classic moment because I was really going. To, I, when really I read is. that, I was thinking the same way. Hey, look, yeah. when I'm gone, I know where I'm going. I know I'm going to see Jesus. So you know, so my loved ones that. will be taken care of. So come and get me. Yeah, just come, come and get me. Hey, you know, they'll move. They'll move. Okay. Mark, okay. They'll move Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. They're more <laughs> hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, you guys. Now, wait, 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 wait. Because you guys got to explain. You guys got to explain. You got to explain to the audience then why you find it humorous. Go ahead, Will. Uh, you know, I, out of respect for the Gray family, I, I want them to, un- or anyone to understand, we're not diminishing the loss of their loved one. Right. But. When I look at that, I say, wow, what is the message that's sort of being sent here? And if you are in a community of, you know, hopelessness, like we know what exists in uh, in that section of Baltimore and kind of in Miami, so we know it's like, what are you, you know, as a city, what are you saying here? It's like you're, you're putting more value on let's avoid going through the legal Cost of all it, right? Let's avoid the true. I mean, I know they still have They're to go through have a to criminal trial, tr- criminal yeah. trial have criminal but it's trial. like let's avoid that stuff. And then it's like, if you're avoiding all that, are you ever going to get back to really yes. addressing the real problem that erupted this in the first place? And the thing is, the answer is no. no. Hell no. Yeah. So that's why I look at it. It's just like you shake your head and. To keep it's yourself from buying. being sad, you know, you got to laugh right. about it because, you know, that's that's the message there. Well, yeah. well, well, Barbara, if, if you look at legal settlements as relates to police misconduct uh, or police brutality or what's called under the color of law actions that are taken by law enforcement, the settlements are much higher for individuals that actually live. Look at Rodney King settlement. And there are many other. There's actually a study done. Um, it was. It was actually, How much did Rodney King get? Forty million. Forty million. Forty million. 40 million one per hit. Uh, one per hit. One uh, per hit. <laughs> and I mean, th- th- that was a brutal attack that, that that he took. Bottom line, you had police officers. Everybody saw it. LAPD just standing around taking turns. So it was more of a frustration and individuals that were really abusing their power. Uh, this element is fairly low when, when you look at the loss of the life compared to the actual brutality that others receive. But then, like I said, there was a study conducted about the city of Baltimore and the amount of settlements that they have uh, reached with individuals for police misconduct. In addition to that, the amount of, of suits that are pending. One of my former law professors, I mean, he would, uh, would do cases in Louisiana regarding police misconduct, and there was one parish that would continually do the same thing over and over again. Okay, million dollar, million dollars here, million dollars right. there. They just kept they doing just it. They'd rather pay it off. They'd rather pay it off. Deal, deal with the issue. Exactly, right. and, and it falls on the taxpayers. It yeah, falls but, on the taxpayers. But the taxpayers Bill. of the uh, Commonwealth of Maryland or the state of Maryland saw to that. The legislator made a change, and they capped it to $950,000 plus your potential earnings. So that is the law in in the in, in, in Maryland, according to a news report that I read the other day. The caps at nine fifty. Then plus what your earning potential would be if you continued to live. And so that's how they got to that six point four. Oh no, they just well, they just they argued. just went over it. They just oh, they went said over actually it. what the, the state's not going to try to reimburse themselves again. But uh, if if they really went to it, he deserves nine hundred fifty thousand. That's what the state allows under their constitution. Mm. But you can get future earnings, and there's no way in the world he's worth. You know, I'm just saying again, five or six million dollars in future earnings. Just you can't you can't get to that. But instead of doing by following the law, getting to the truth, the jury just did this, and that's where it is. I'm sure nobody's going to go back to try to undo it. Oh no, that, that's a that's a done deal. That settlement. Yeah, so that that's a done deal, and then they're going to move on. And what I did not hear, and I don't know if any of you have heard, whether or not they got the change of venue. No, they did not. They did not get it. The right. judge denied it. He said it would be an insult to the people of Baltimore. Oh. Stating, oh, no. stating, <laughs> and this was his reasoning. The judge stated, and this is the decision that came down yesterday. Uh, about five, about five thirty. I was wow. listening to it. Um, it would be an insult to the people of Baltimore to say that we cannot find twelve reasonable individuals in the city in order to hear the facts and to render a just judgment. Hmm. Wow. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Last month we talked. We were talking about towards the end of 
our discussion uh, about the middle class. And Bill, you made a statement. We're going to play that statement now um, about uh, the middle class and its responsibility. And we said we were going to go back and continue that discussion. So let's listen to Bill's comment from last month first. Our generation, especially my generation, mm -hmm. we were the middle class to upper generation. So as soon as we got all of these advantages that Martin Luther King and so many people fought for, personally, I moved as far away from the ghetto of Kansas exactly. City exactly. as your resources possibly could. That's right. And I went out and got a job in New York City and Cleveland and Chicago and bought me the most expensive Porsche that I could find. Which was your right. And, and, which was my right, mm -hmm. but it wasn't my responsibility. Hmm. My responsibility was to stay where I was, continue to try to fight for what our grandparents and everybody else had fought for until we could get some stability in our community. But when all the doctors left, when all the lawyers left, when all the teachers left, mm -hmm. and when all the preachers left, and they still don't even live anywhere near these churches that they're doing in these inner cities, that's what happened. We had a societal breakdown. So is it our responsibility, the middle black, the black middle class's responsibility, to stay there and bring everyone else up, as you stated, Bill? It pains me today to hear that, but it's absolutely true, and we should have. We abandoned our brothers and sisters uh, after we stood on the shoulders of these great, great, great leaders and psych Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and all mm -hmm. the rest, Angela Davis, Chaka Khan. And you, you don't understand why I'm mentioning their names, because they were Black Panthers, and, and they were mm -hmm. fighting for freedom, and they were fighting for us, and they went to jail. They lost their income. They were ridiculed. Uh, the FBI made them leopards. Uh, and what did we do? We walked away. And I feel so horribly bad about it. I almost think about it every day as to lives I could have helped, the situations I could have added value to, the role models that we could have made and done and fought for our institutions our hospitals, our banks, our, our, our schools, our infrastructure, our police force, all those kind of institutional things that we could have contributed to and I should have contributed to, I did not do. Now, I'm not so bad with my life. We did good. All my kids are happy and fine and doing well, but they have no sense of the community whatsoever. As much as I tried to, to build it into it now, it's too late. And that I got so mad at my son, he did everything perfect, went to UVA, played football, went to law school, got his law degree, and then I told him, why don't you go back to the community and try to do something? He said, as soon as I make this amount of money, I'll think about it. And I, I was getting ready to choke him, but then I had to look in the mirror and said, wait, hey, that's what I taught you. That's what you saw. So mm -hmm. do as I do, whether do as I say. But Wait, go ahead, Carol. To a large extent, I do agree with you, and I have the <laughs> same battle with myself, but I also think that Maybe you can't do anything about the past, but what you do is with the present. And you say, okay, I didn't go back, but instead of going back, what I can do is I volunteer here or I contribute there, just as you do. And you say, all right, here's this kid that needs tutoring or here's this situation in my church. I'm, I take what I am now and give back and continue to give back. You can't continue to beat yourself up about what you didn't do in the past. Well, you know, my question, though, to you guys is because I hear this a lot about our community, that, that there's this, this, this feeling that there's a, a, a responsibility for us to do this. But I don't mm -hmm. hear this from other communities. I, and I, oh. and I, no, That's no, 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 point. let me finish. Let me finish because I hear, it, because what I get back is, well, you know, um, immigrant, immigrant communities, for example, they will bring one family member over and then another family member, over, but that's within the nucleus family. What I hear about the black community is that my responsibility as a black middle class person is to bring up everybody. They're not, whether they're related to me or mm -hmm. not, that that's different. That's so why is that? Is that because we were brought out, um, you know, from from another country or another continent, and and so our collective family is our entire community? What do you think, Will? I think so. I think because the black community's experience has been different than other ethnic groups, and I think that stems from Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, um, Mary McLeod Bethune. I think it's it stems from that. And I think that, uh, for me, the black middle class's best thing that it can do is not stand in 
and the way of his own people. Amen. And exactly. I've been, you Explain know, and this could, well, yeah. hey, hey I, don't have, I don't have a problem going there because uh, I've experienced it in this community. I've experienced it in some others where individuals um, in certain institutions, you know, whether it was my time at the pilot, for example, and people within the pilot who I broke bread with mm-hmm. on a personal standpoint when my name comes up in a conversation about someone who's going to be able to maintain a job or not didn't necessarily stand up for me. And these are people who I broke bread for Mm -hmm. and, you know, decisions are being made and you're looking at, well, we're not going to let this person go because he has kids in college. He's married. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking at me. Well, I was, I was married. I had kids <laughs> yeah. getting ready to go in college. Why is someone not standing up for me? So what happens a lot of times is that what we tend to do as a, as a group of people is not is, is sort of compete with ourselves and sort of have this mindset of, well, I've got this little slot, so let me protect this slot. <laughs> and if I present myself in a certain way to other people, like I'm trying to give favor, which is what all groups of people do, <laughs> now I put my slot at risk. And the other thing that I think that we can do is and should be focused on is developing business. Bill mentioned earlier about uh, Virginia being a place where things were opened up with opportunities yeah. to develop business. That's the that's the in this country is the most important one of the most important things you can do is to develop businesses right. and hire people and provide opportunities for people because you cannot pass down a no, job. Absolutely. And that's a lot of what happened to the black community. So mm-hmm. now you're looking at I was looking at an article in the Atlantic done earlier this year in January talking about how children like mine, like yours, mm-hmm. raised in, in, in the middle class are falling out of the black middle class Absolutely. Sure. Mm-hmm. and black middle class wealth during the past eight years, unfortunately under Obama has, has basically been zapped. Oh, went down. And why is that less emphasis on business, more on jobs, and you cannot mm-hmm. pass yeah. down a job, especially if there's another black person in there. <laughs> that's, <laughs> not <laughs> going, that's not going to protect your job. <laughs> Eric. Well, well, Barbara, I, I think everyone has very valid points. And you mentioned our, co- our collective effort and, and collective responsibility. And that's true because our experience is different. Um, a lot of immigrants, especially uh, European immigrants and those uh, who are who are lighter complexion, Southeast Asian and so forth, can assimilate within American mainstream society much easier. Okay, and plus they have they still have their a homeland that they can go back and trace their families to and things of that nature. But I think the African American community, you know, we have you know everything was pretty much stripped down through the part of slavery and. Our problems and issues are collective problem and issues. Uh, case in point, we go back to the community policing issue. You know, I'm African American, I'm black, I'm well educated, so forth and so on, well versed. But when I take off this bow tie and this blazer and I put on some jeans and a t shirt and a cap, I look just like everyone else in, in the neighborhood and can be mistaken for that. And lives, my life could, could be taken because of that. It's happened many times before. I think also after the civil rights movement, what ended up happening, two things. African-American community fell into what we call the live integration, where we believe that you had to be like whites in order to be accepted into the world, as opposed to appreciating who you were and what you brought to the table and the history of African-Americans and uh, in, in moving from there and going back and reinvesting in the community. My father, who I think every day is the wisest man in the world, because every time I look around, it's like, yeah, he was right. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he told me, he said, he said, son, the greatest investment you can make is in people because it's the investment that knows no limit of return. And by doing that, my father still lives in the same neighborhood we grew up in. The neighborhood has turned. And I even said to my father, Dad, why don't you move out and build your house around the lake when everybody was building a home? He said, son, if I leave, who's going to be left? There you go. And he's still there. And and because of that example, and my father was a biz, small business owner as well, because of that example is the reason why I do what I do. So my fight – and. My my fight from here on out uh, until the day I die is the second part of the civil rights movement, which is economic education, self-awareness, self-confidence, and the history, education of the history of African Americans. This is America. In the words of Don King, all in America. Okay, <laughs> Anything can happen. It's the greatest country on earth. So I'm here to tell you that business is about investing in yourself, investing in your family, investing in your community, and building your business because African Americans, we have a great history. We have a 
great people and the rest of we need to know it and understand it and the rest of the world needs to know it as well and there's opportunity in that. Carol. Wow. I think when I think of the transition between generations, and and in fact, I was talking to my class about it this morning, is that so much of my life I was taught, get an education, get an education, get an education. And that would make a difference. But I wasn't taught about necessarily about giving back and how that education empowered me to give back. And a lot of that education and I don't want to sound, I'm not a capitalist, but should have been on economics. Yes, education, but also building an economic right. base that allows you not only to give back on an individual level, but to teach other people about economic development so they can support um, black-owned banks, bank-owned businesses, Hospital. taxicab companies, hospitals, the whole nine years. That part was missing. And so I think that's an important part of the evolution, even – Uh, at Norfolk State or Hampton University, the marriage between politics, economics, and development. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a call from Mark in Norfolk. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. Yeah, good afternoon, and happy fifth anniversary to you. Thank you so much. I I just want to say I love Bill Thomas. Oh, thank you. I I love him. Uh, Mr. Thomas, you hit the nail right on the head, you know, I'm a baby buster, 1966. Okay. And what your generation did out of well-meaning and love is that you said, get an education, get an education. Mm-hmm. We want you to do better, do better. But I think what I think your generation didn't do, you did not clarify or explain to us what better was. So the lack of that translation interpreted to exactly what you went off and did, you left as quick as you could, (laughs) as soon as you could, and you acquired what in your mind was better. And then meanwhile, back at the ranch, (laughs) we're now reaping the harvest of vacation of our responsibility. And we have neighborhoods that were once great professionally great, mm-hmm. just busting through the seams with potential. Now we're so spread out and diverse and selfish, we have to find a way to find a way to get ourselves back to greatness. Thanks, Mark, for the call. We really appreciate it. I hate to cut you off, but we've got one more topic we need to get to. Um, but we appreciate you listening, and thank you for the good wishes. Got some yeah, right. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, no, no. And he loves Bill. No, 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 no. Yeah, as a fellow, as a fellow baby buster, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so proud to hear him say that. And I've been uh, telling him that over the past five years. That's what you all did. And then we created hip hop, and then you, and then you got mad at us for creating hip hop. Like, you abandoned us. You took you, you, you took what you had. You don't think I listen sometimes. See, I, do I appreciate listen. it. See, yeah, so my listen. fellow okay, baby which is, buster, which is a perfect Gen transition <laughs> into you all's thoughts about the five years that you've been on the radio with us. Because I want to get your individual thoughts about being a part of another view. And I'm going to start with you, Will, because you know you're the journalist and the talk show host, and you know <laughs> the man and all that stuff. <laughs> So tell us tell us about your feelings about being on the show these past five years. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I appreciate you for allowing me to Thank even you. take part in this. And you know that you and I go back, you know, some years, and I remember even when you were developing the idea and so forth. And I know, being a radio show host, how difficult it is to do this and that it takes time to figure it out and what it is that you want to do. And people need to give you time. And in that time, as you're going through – trying to figure out, not being sure you need support. And a lot of times I know how you felt. I felt the same way being out there on a limb and walk, looking around <laughs> and like, where everybody at? Where everybody? But everybody's saying, but they pointing at you saying, yeah, go go tell our story. You know, but you're wondering, did, you know, are you out there? So you really have to, you know, walk by faith. And I think that this panel, I, I think for the listeners, is showing them the diversity in which, uh, comes out of the community, just as the caller, you know, being a Gen X as I am, and, you know, you've got boomers here, 
and you see the diversity of thought, you see the the, the uh, sensitivity that we bring to it, and that we're not monolithic, but we be- both share the same, all share the same passion, which is to improve our community and improve America in general. Great. Thank you, Will. Bill? No, no, no. I, I think uh, from the very beginning, and I, I've always wanted to have a strong message of individual responsibility, and especially African-American men and their responsibility to uh, show our women and great, 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 great respect and uh, leave the government alone. I I just think the government has been so bad for African-Americans on the federal level in most cases. Some cases have been good, uh, but in most cases, and we kind of abandon our own initiatives to be able to protect ourselves with the Second Amendment and defend our families and defend our religion and defend the things that we thought, but we were we had just been and that's why i have an issue with what i got quote liberals because the, the good things <laughs> okay. that the, the good i was raised in a very very conservative family as were most of you were and but we didn't call it republicans we just called it you do as you were told to do so <laughs> my point is the five years i've been able to go from one end of the spectrum to the other to right now i listen more i i am more sensitive to what people say and will and, and everything and and uh, I think that's the biggest part of my contribution here, to have the people listen to some things and then try to balance the difference and come up with a conclusion. So that's it. <laughs> and we love you, Bill. Right, hey. We really do, Carol. Now get some more women out there. Hey, I'm in, I'm in need of love. I, I'm single. <laughs> Carol. Well, with that said, moving on. Um, <laughs> yes, first of all, Barbara, I want to thank you for including in me, me in this because um, – as an academic, a lot of times you see feel like you are remote from the community. Yes, you're engaged and you're invited to do things, but you're put almost on a semi-pedestal without actually touching people who have real concerns. So this program has allowed me to to touch the issues that are of concern to the African-American community and to bring those questions, because I use these questions back to my classes, <laughs> Great. and to look at it as a learning experience and hopefully giving my students the same passion and enjoyment. If they could see the enjoyment, then they will follow. So you, this show has done a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Eric, I know you're a newcomer <laughs> to the show, but what are your thoughts? <laughs> Well, well, first of all, congratulations to you, Barbara, your staff, and uh, for all that you've done in this in this area. Uh, since arriving, you know, like I, like I said, I've been a listener to of NPR Public uh, National Public Radio since I was in eighth grade or, or maybe seventh. And as soon as I come to an area, I find that you know that particular dial. And I remember I found you one Friday, and I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> and and I, I remember we had an opportunity to meet for the first time in Hampton University, I want to say in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I arrived, right shortly after I arrived in 2011, and we just had a kindred spirit. I mean, I I, I tell my wife, you know, that's my sister, you know, Barbara. <laughs> and, and, you know, she said, oh, you did love Barbara so much, don't you? And I said, I said yeah, honey, Lisa. So... With that, with that being said, your your the topics, your voice, the show itself, it stands out, uh, and it's the only one out here. But hopefully, that will change very very soon. Others will come behind you. And again, just want to thank you. Congratulations, and not just for five years, but I'm speaking for five more years as well. Yeah, here, yeah. I hope so. I want to read you something that Roger sent us since he was sick and he couldn't speak. So let me tell you I what mean, he, he said. Get, Roger couldn't get up. Roger couldn't get up. So he's oh. such a liberal. Oh. He's such a liberal. Oh, listen to what Roger said. Liberal. Roger, we're feeling for you. Oh. You couldn't get out of your bed. <laughs> All right, come on. I don't want to run out of time, oh, y'all. Heard. Come on I'm now. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> okay. Okay. Roger said, I've enjoyed the past half dozen years. The listening public has welcomed me on another view. I've tried to use this monthly platform to inform Hampton Roads about issues, gun violence, politics, racial inequality that are critical to blacks both locally and nationally. When possible, I've used the interviews and research that have bolstered my columns at the Virginian Pilot to bring insight to another audience, this time on the radio. The planning we do beforehand is as important as the show itself. It's been fun. Sometimes it's been heated. 
<laughs> I've told my colleagues, and I, I'm told my colleagues and I are often entertaining. Well, at least some of us. I think that's to you, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Occasionally, the shows are frustrating. We on the roundtable tend to discuss topics again and again that defy easy solutions. Def- def- mm. Deficient education, high rates of incarceration, the lack of household wealth, apathy. Still, I'm glad we get a chance to tackle those issues and that we try to devise ways to improve our lot. Or that we can debunk stereotypes and provide perspectives that some listeners hadn't considered. Thank you, Barbara, Lisa, Carol, Bill, and Will, for exchanging ideas, challenging me, and being there every month. There is a correction Roger that Chesley. needs to be made for all of you students out there. A half a dozen is not five. A half a dozen is not five. Oh, he, you know what? He included the time on no, TV. No, 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 no. Don't make an excuse. Yeah, yeah, a half yeah. a dozen is six. Yeah. We're still on our fifth you anniversary. Know what? No, I know. He, but you know what? Now, in his he, defense, he in his, don't, don't make no excuse. He didn't have a copy editor. Come on, now. You know, we were lying at copy editor. Come on. In his defense, I got you back, Robert. Don't try to defend that. In his defense, he did ask me how long had we been on all together because the round table you got started yeah. on TV. Well, that was and we were on the air for two years on television. And that's eight. And that's seven. <laughs> <laughs> and five years on the radio. So. Rogers, <laughs> that, was, that was a cop. And he did write a column, too. That was and a he column. did write a and column. He did some I was like, <laughs> yeah, you, every great columnist needs an even and better while editor. while you're mentioning that, there's any investors that want to take us to another level, you can call Barbara and invest some of your retirement mm-hmm. funds of all you people who have money, and we can go out and become entrepreneurs and make a little bit of money for oh, the station like and do some things. And I'm sure Barbara will leave, leave her number. Oh, we would and, love uh, to syndicate the show, money, would we and, not? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because this, is, this is a very unique never asked, you know, never panel received. that really uh, could benefit mm-hmm. from a, a national exposure. I think that Absolutely. it would be very beneficial for the and nation. And that would be. And you know what? We're going to do it again next month. There you so go. So thank there you very, go. very much, Roundtable. And producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer yes. Victor Bowen, and I want to say a very special thank you to you you, our audience, for allowing us to spend time with you every Friday at noon, for allowing us to bring you a different perspective on today's issues, for being willing to hear another view, because it is because of you and your support that we've been on the air for five years, and we're just getting started. We'd love to hear from you, so please drop us a line at contact at anotherviewradio.org. And don't forget to visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and sound up for our eView newsletter, a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. Next week, Birth of an Answer, celebrating 100 years of African American creative responses to the silent film Birth of a Nation. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Jessica Jane, I think, answered our phones. I'm Barbara Hamley. Make it a wonderful weekend, everyone. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view. Happy birthday, another view. (laughs) 